I'm Randy May, uh, president of the Free State Foundation, and uh, I want to welcome you all all here. Uh, this is one of the series of lunch programs that we uh, do, and I, when I look around, I see that many, many of you have been here many times uh, before, and I appreciate that, but I always see some, some new faces, and uh, that's uh, something that uh, pleases me, of course, and welcome, welcome to all the new, the new faces. So this uh, program today uh, is titled a new FCC or same old, same old. And by the way, I uh, was going to mention this later, but I should mention it now. So the, the Twitter handle, I think it's on your uh, bio sheet, but it's uh, uh, hashtag a new FCC. So, uh, of course, feel free to tweet away, but other than tweeting away, don't do anything else with those smartphones, but, uh, but listen today. So uh, to set the stage for the discussion today, I'm just going to read the way I described today's program in the uh, promotional announcements that I sent out, because I think that's uh, really the uh, prompt uh, we want to use for the uh, discussion. Uh, I said, with Tom Wheeler and Michael O'Reilly scheduled to arrive shortly as the new FCC chairman and commissioner, the FCC will be back to its full five-member complement. With the newly reconstituted FCC in place, and with ongoing dramatic changes in the communications and internet marketplace occurring almost daily, this program will explore questions such as, should we expect to see long overdue institutional reforms at the FCC? What specifically should be done, if anything, to reorient the agency consistent with the, these dramatic marketplace and technological changes that I mentioned? What reforms can be implemented without congressional action by the agency? If congressional action is needed, are there measures short of a comprehensive overhaul of the Communications Act that should be enacted more quickly? Now, uh, as I said, I know some of you were with us in June when we had another uh, excellent program in this same venue. And that program was titled, If I Were the Chairman. And like today, that program was premised uh, pretty much on the notion that Tom Wheeler uh, and Michael O'Reilly uh, would arrive at the FCC sometime fairly soon. Uh, and that's still my, still my hope. So uh, as the prompt for the June program, I asked the panelists what they would do if, if they were the new FCC uh, chairman. And in many ways, of course, that's just another way of uh, asking the question, a new FCC or the same old, same old. Uh, and if Wheeler and O'Reilly don't arrive at the FCC fairly soon, then I'm probably going to run out of titles. Uh, for what, what in many respects is essentially uh, the same program. Uh, by the way, I think the, that much of the discussion that we're going to have today probably, uh, or at least in some ways, will mirror the uh, discussion that took place yesterday uh, at the House uh, uh, committee hearing uh, concerning uh, the IP transition. The official title of that hearing was the evolution of the wired network, uh, but uh, to my mind, it basically was all about, you know, what what new policies we should have as uh, we transition from the old uh, legacy networks to to new broadband uh, networks. And I'm sure, in many ways, that'll be at the core of. Uh, some of the things we're talking about today. <clears throat> now, as you know uh, from reading the announcements, uh, Congressman Bob Latta uh, was supposed to deliver opening remarks. Uh, the bottom line is he's still going to be here. Uh, that's what I uh, was just informed uh, a, a few minutes ago. But they're having a uh, House hearing this morning, uh, House Commerce Committee hearing on uh, uh, Obamacare, if I can use the shorthand, and uh, I guess for some reason and for some people, 
they think that that's more important than the IP transition or the things we're going to be talking about uh, today. But anyway, he's going to come, and when he does come, uh, depending on the time, we may have to, uh, we, you know, we may interrupt. Uh, I've, I've reversed the order. We're going to reverse the order, and uh, with the indulgence of the uh, gentleman up here, we may have to interrupt and, and uh, have Congressman Latta speak. When you can tell him, or we'll tell him that we read, we already read his really long bio that's on his website. We're just we're just going to do the really short version. Uh, so, uh, so I think speaking of bios and the short version, it, to get us started, what I'm going to do is now introduce the uh, panelist, and uh, we're going to go down. I think we'll just go down the uh, row here uh, in the order in which the panelists are, are seated, uh, I've asked them to limit their initial remarks to no more than six minutes. Uh, I think everyone but Bill Kovacic has appeared at one of our programs at, at one time or another, and, and they know that I'm a, a meanie in this regard. I'm going to enforce the six, six minutes, just like Chairman Walden enforced the five li minute limit at the at the house here and so we'll 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 do that we'll play by the house rules and uh and and then after their initial presentations uh we're gonna have an interactive discussion uh hopefully they'll be responding to each other i'm i'm, I'm gonna ask them to do that and i'm sure I've, i'll have a few questions but uh this is where you you guys come in i'm gonna make sure we have some time for questions uh from the uh audience uh, as well, uh, so we can have, uh, as I said, a uh, uh, interactive uh, discussion. Okay, so I'm going to do the uh, the uh, introductions, uh, uh, giving you the uh, two two sentence highlight version, and we'll get started. Uh, first, we have James Assey, and James is uh, Executive Vice President of the National Cable Tele Telecommunications Association. Uh, and he's been in that role since early 2008. Uh, James is the uh, second uh, most senior executive over at NCTA. And before that, he was a longtime senior official uh, in, in the US, at the US Senate Commerce uh, Committee. And uh, so next, we'll hear from uh, Bob Quinn. Uh, Bob is senior vice president. Uh, you see, we have a lot of seniors here. Uh, not, I mean, I qualify by virtue of age, but, but these, these guys by position. Uh, Bob is senior vice president, uh, federal regulatory and chief privacy officer for AT&T. Uh, so he leads AT&T's federal regulatory group, uh, and he's also responsible uh, for customer privacy po policies at the international, federal, and state level across all of their businesses. That pretty much covers the whole world, doesn't it? The international, it international, federal, state world. Uh, so next we're going to hear from uh, uh, Jim Spada, uh, Professor uh, James Spader. Uh, Jim is a, he is class of 1940 research professor of law at Northwestern University School of Law. He doesn't look like all, that old to be the class <laughs> class of 1940, but but uh, I'm sure that's a, a, that was a very special class that, in, that endowed that chair. Uh, so, uh, Jim is also senior, senior associate dean for academic affairs in international in initiatives and director of executive LOM programs at Northwestern University. That's quite a string of, of titles that uh, Jim holds. But but and uh, probably most important of all, he's he's a member of the Free State Foundation Board of Academic Advisors, and and Jim has appeared at uh, a number of our previous programs. Uh, and, you know, I'll just add, I, I don't know whether it was on the website, someone else put these, this together for me, but I know Jim a number of times has won the Outstanding uh, Teacher Awards in, in the, the law school. 
And then uh, finally, uh, we're going to hear hear from William uh, Kavashik. Uh, so uh, Bill is a professor of law and public policy and director of the Competition Law Center at the George Washington University Law School. Uh, he's a recognized expert in the field of antitrust law, competition policy, as well as government contracts law. Uh, and I think importantly for our purposes today, uh, Professor Kavasik has served as uh, general counsel, commissioner, and then chair of the Federal Trade Commission, uh, that trifecta. I think Dick Wiley did that over in our realm a long, a long time ago, but it, it, that's obviously uh, uh, unusual and, and quite a distinction to, to serve in those three uh, capacities. And then I might add that Bill, just in the past few months, he was named a non-executive director, I want to get this right, uh, of the United Kingdom's new Competition and Markets Authority. Bill, uh, when he assumed that post, he informed me that that on condition of accepting that uh, position, which is obviously a high honor, he had to drop off of the Free State Foundation's Board of Academic Advisors. I, I'm not quite sure. I was puzzled by that choice that he made, but <laughs> but but anyway, when he when he gets through serving over in that position at the UK, hopefully he'll he'll re rejoin the uh, that distinguished group of academics. So with that introduction, uh, we're going to uh, first turn to James again for up to uh, six minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll move uh, right down the line. James. Okay. Thank you, Randy, and I'm, I'm going to start my stopwatch, but you know, feel free to give me the hook. I'm, I'm used to it. Um, it's great to see everyone uh, today, uh, and uh, I will try to start from the question uh, that you posed, uh, although maybe I'll, I'll change it around a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm sure neither Tom Wheeler nor Michael Riley need my advice as far as how to organize the commission, and certainly uh, it doesn't really matter the, the titles you have or the, uh, the organizational <coughs> work workflow that you have. What matters is how the agency uh, uh, reacts and uh, behaves uh, in respect to the issues of the day. So, you know, from my perspective, and I, uh, since I'm the only, well, not the only, but I'm the predominant video guy uh, up here, I'll, I'll speak from the perspective of the, the video industries today. Um, I don't really necessarily think of it as a reorientation uh, that the FCC needs to approach. I think of it more as uh, a rededication um, to uh, what we have experienced over the past uh, few years on a bipartisan basis, and that is uh, a consumer-centric, market-driven approach uh, to regulation. Uh, I think any new commissioner, any new chairman that comes into the commission has to immediately take stock uh, of the major trends uh, that, are, uh, that are occurring in the communication space, uh, much as Julius did when he came in and uh, started with the National Broadband Plan. Uh, and I think that there are uh, some important trends that uh, give us great hope. Um, we have uh, incredibly robust competition in communications markets, both horizontally but also uh, vertically as well, as uh, players in different parts of the communication stack are competing to provide consumers with uh, the, the services that they are increasingly demanding. Uh, we see substantial and ongoing investment from major network providers who are uh, constantly trying to outdo each other and outdo themselves in uh, increasing both the capabilities and reach uh, of their network. And we're seeing an inexorable uh, evolution to a software uh, and IP technology world that is driving faster and faster innovation cycles. Uh, which uh, s sometimes strain belief if you look back, say, 20 years ago at how long it took the cable industry to bring a product to market versus what happens today. Um, and in each of those cases, I think the uh, result is indisputably positive for consumers. We have 
better quality services. Uh, we have uh, greater improvements in the service capabilities, greater choice in the devices on which we can consume communications and entertainment services. And as I said, we have these faster innovation cycles. So the challenge for the FCC, I think, is, is roughly threefold. Uh, first, how do we continue this positive story? Uh, we have created a virtuous cycle of investment and innovation. Uh, what strategies uh, can we adopt as a commission to ensure that that uh, continues for the foreseeable future? Secondly, how can we adapt uh, the statute we have to reflect uh, changing market conditions? Uh, and then lastly, what are the gaps that we need the government uh, and the FCC to step in uh, when the market will not uh, meet the social goal that we're trying to reach? Um, and I'll just mention in, in a couple different respects before turning over the mic uh, a, a couple places that I think we ought to start. Um, first, um, it's too bad Congressman Ladd is not here for me to plug his bill, um, but in the video space, I think, uh, you know, he has done a, a great service in identifying uh, an FCC rule with respect to the integration ban in his bill, H.R. 3196, that has demonstrably outlived its usefulness. We are talking about a world in video that is more competitive than it has ever been before. Uh, we have evolved from a market uh, which in 1992 cable operators controlled 98% uh, of video distribution. Today that number is down to 55% and falling. Uh, and we are left with a rule that essentially uh, requires the cable operators, and I should say cable operators alone among its video competitors, to go to the FCC and ask permission to innovate. Now, Apple just launched its iPad uh, or its new announcement yesterday. They didn't have to go anywhere and ask permission uh, to innovate. And it seems uh, that the only thing we are doing uh, in maintaining a rule uh, that has outlived its usefulness is really staying true to a history that is no longer relevant uh, in this day and age. So we're very hopeful uh, that uh, Chairman Latta, uh, excuse me, uh, Vice Chairman Latta and Congressman Green, who've introduced this legislation, will be successful in moving it. And we hope that the FCC will, will take stock of uh, the rules that uh, are in place that pr um, impede our innovation. I think with respect to broadband, obviously we know that we have a, uh, a net neutrality case out there pending. Uh, and without going into the puts and takes on how that will uh, turn out, which um, others may go into, I think uh, regardless, one of the things that obviously we need to keep in mind is the need for uh, regulatory humility, uh, a, a policy that was started uh, under Chairman Kennard uh, and has been continued through Republican and Democratic FCCs and, as I said, has created this kind of virtuous cycle of investment that continues uh, to inure to consumers' <laughs> benefits. Um, thirdly, with respect to spectrum, I think the uh, administration has set out an ambitious goal of liberating uh, 500 megahertz uh, of spectrum, not only for licensed users but also for unlicensed users, which uh, uh, the cable industry of late has put substantial investments into building out outdoor Wi-Fi hotspots. We have now over 200,000 and counting Wi-Fi hotspots that cable uh, broadband customers can use when they're out of doors in parks or wherever people live, work, and play. Uh, and that's another way in which uh, the industry is continuing to create value and innovate. And, and lastly, I think with respect to the, the social compact and issues like universal service, where we recognize that there are places where the markets are not going to permit uh, broadband networks to extend, uh, we need to come up with a responsible, uh, reformed universal service program that will direct uh, scarce, limited federal dollars to the places where uh, investment isn't. So that's my hope for the FCC. Uh, and I hope that uh, Tom and Mike are over there in good speed. Uh, okay, well, we a lot of us second that, I'm sure. Uh, thanks very much, James. And uh, I, I just got a message, actually, that 
uh, Congressman Latta is in the car, so I guess they worked out all the problems with the computer system for Obamacare this morning, and he's on his way. Uh, so uh, we're going to turn to uh, Bob Quinn uh, next, another one of our senior uh, executives. Bob? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Um, so I, I agree with everything that James said, I, but I, <laughs> I'm going to disagree with his premise. I think the FCC absolutely needs to reorient itself. Um, it's an agency that was created uh, almost 80 years ago uh, to regulate a monopoly, wireline, voice world that doesn't exist. Uh, I think they adapted to uh, end up regulating what I think they would consider to have been at the time a monopoly cable environment. I know, I know, James will tell me that that never existed, and but I think I think it, does, it it certainly doesn't exist now, right? So I I actually think they do um, need to reorient, and I think it's not just the FCC. I think I think it's regulation in general in this country because you know James doesn't have to live with fifty state public service commissions, but we do. And, and I really believe that we have to have kind of a whole restart, if you will, on the regulatory mindset, because the regulatory mindset at both the state and the federal level was designed to regulate a wireline voice monopoly. And, and I think it's hard for the commission to get its arms around the notion of what does it do in this new world? And I think it's gonna be very, very difficult. And I think the, the fact that they have the FCC haven't really done anything on our IP transition position, which will be um, one year old on November 7th, is evidence that they don't know exactly how to make this transition into the new world, and they're not ready to declare what their role is going to be. Um, and I think the response to the petitions that we got from both the CELEC community and from the state commissions was very telling. The CELEC community says, hey, we can't, you shouldn't do any trials on this until you basically go out and reverse the FCC, uh, they have at least three distinct orders, probably more, where the FCC decided that they were not going to take this old Title II common carriage regulation and import it into the IP world. Um, there's at least three distinct cases that the FCC says, hey, you have to overturn this before you can even consider these issues. And in addition to that, I think they would tell you that we also want to import all of these Title II interconnection obligations, not only into the IP world, but also into the wireless world. Um, in ways that, that I think is just fundamentally inconsistent with everything the commission has done up to date. The state commissions have said the same exact thing. They've said, look, you can't even start this transition. I, with, with the panel you referenced yesterday, um, the state commissioner that was on the panel who's in charge currently of the Nehru Telecommunications Committee said, you can't start this thing until the FCC finally you know, gets off its behind and, and declares that VoIP is a telecommunications service like we've been telling it to do for a long time because if VoIP isn't a telecommunications service, then the state commissions don't have a role or a clearly defined role like they do under the current Title II world that everybody lives in. And I, I, I think that I think that's gonna be the biggest issue for for people to get over and the FCC absolutely has to reorient to deal with it. And an example that I'll give you um, of showing exactly how far we have to go, I'm gonna point to the text to 911 area that we went through with the commission last year. Well, when they decided that it was gonna be really important to have texting capabilities so that you could send a text messaging message to 911, the order that the staff drafted and sent up to the A4 said, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna impose this obligation on the SMS technology that's deployed by the cell carriers. Now, leaving aside the fact that, I, and my kids don't use the text messaging that's offered by the carriers, I wish they did, but they don't. But because the, the reality is they've got WhatsApp, they've got all these over-the-top applications, and the FCC was going to define the world by the legacy technology because they're comfortable 
imposing those obligations on AT&T and Verizon, in this case on Sprint and T-Mobile, they're not comfortable trying to understand what, how, how do we attack this in the new world. And they weren't ready to do it. So what did they end up doing? They backed off everything. They took a voluntary commitment from us. But it's because they're not capable right now of trying to figure out how do we get our arms around this? They clearly have jurisdiction over information service providers. There's a whole series of orders where they've deregulated the Vonage order, where they told the state commissions you can't regulate Vonage like a, 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 a carrier. They said, hey, we don't have to decide whether this is an information service or a telecommunication service, which are code words for common carriage and non-common carriage under the current law that we have. We don't have to decide because we've got jurisdiction over both. They really have to reorient themselves to start thinking about these services, not in the way that they were provisioned for the last hundred years. They've got to start thinking about these services and how they're going to be provisioned for the next hundred years. And I would say that there are some hard questions because companies like Apple provide text messaging. And if they want to impose a 911 obligation, they're going to have to deal with the fact that these services over which they have traditionally had jurisdiction are, are not provided in the same way. And, they're, and, I, and I think it's going to take a complete mindset reorientation for them to be able to get their arms around that. And I'll try and, did I stay under my six minutes? I came close, I think. You, you are good. Uh, and thank you. And, um, and uh, so there was a, a different uh, emphasis, I think, in your remarks from, from James in, in terms of um, uh, pushing a, l a little bit against the FCC, and so maybe help the two when we get through, James. It, it could, it could be, but I'm, I'm going to give you. A, no, that was, I thought that was unusually straightforward. Uh, so uh, here's the uh, deal. I just got a sign that uh, Commissioner Latta is. Excuse me, uh, he wouldn't want that position. I'm sure. Uh, uh, Congressman Lattice here. So let's give him a big welcome. And uh, I almost said Commissioner Latta, but I quickly correct myself. That you wouldn't want that position. Welcome. Uh, come on up. If you just have a seat, maybe here. Uh, uh, well, thanks for being here. I I, I told the audience uh, beforehand. Uh, you know, that there was a hearing on Obamacare this morning. I think, you know, if I can use that term, I wasn't sure why that would take precedence at all over over being here. But but uh, and then I got the message that you were in your car. And then I told them I, I assumed that everything had been resolved in terms of all the problems that that and uh, the computer system and and all all of that had been resolved. Uh, so we're, we're we're glad you're here. So uh, and I know your uh, time. Uh, uh, it might be limited. So what I want to do, I've already, before you got here, I read your three-page biography. I, I did that. Uh, so I'm just going to do, uh, uh, again, to summarize the, the very short version here and then uh, turn it over to you. But but, but thanks for, uh, I just want to thank you for holding that uh, hearing that you guys did yesterday. I thought that was informative. And we're talking about, obviously, some of the same same things today. Uh, so, Congressman uh, Bob Ladd is currently serving his fourth term in, in the House of Representatives uh, uh, following his re-election in 2012. Uh, most importantly for our purposes here today, he serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, they've got wide-ranging jurisdiction, as you know, but again, even more importantly for the purposes of our discussion today, uh, he's on the uh, subcommittee on uh, communications and technology, and he's vice chair, uh, serves as vice chair uh, <clears throat> of that committee. And I'll just add before turning him over to him, and James just alluded to this congressman before you came, he mentioned one of your bills. I, I'm just going to say that recently, in the past uh, three months or so, Congressman Latta has introduced two bills that, that I think are <clears throat> are important. And, you know, I have to say I've advocated these, as James knows, for a long a long time myself in these areas. And, and one of them is the, the uh, bill, and I forget the number, concerning the set-top box 
uh, uh, deregulation to uh, get rid of the integration ban that currently uh, exists. And and the other one, uh, Congressman Latta introduced a bill back in July that would revise the FCC's forbearance provision, uh, which I happen to think is very important, and not something I've advocated for a long time. While I've still got this mic for 10 seconds, what I would say is just going down the line, I'd urge you to think about even broadening that bill a little further to include all of the commission's regular T's and not, not only <clears throat> the telephone companies, but nevertheless, that's a, I think that's really a commendable effort, too. So uh, all of that's to say he, uh, Congressman Ladd is uh, uh, a very important uh, policymaker in this area, and we're really pleased you're here with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for having me, and I'm sorry I'm late. The uh, yeah, there, there is a little hearing going up uh, right now. The uh, full Energy and Commerce Committee is meeting, and today we're having uh, four of the contractors that uh, developed the site for Obamacare before us. And, of course, on Wednesday of next week, uh, Secretary Sebelius uh, is going to be before us. So the, uh, uh, needless to say, this is one of those hearings. You know, there's some hearings that maybe not everybody shows up to, and, and uh, this day just about I think everybody's seat was filled. Uh, and everyone wanted to make sure they got their questions and on the Republican and on the Democrat side. But I, I, again, like I said, I do appreciate it. I'm sorry I'm late. I always hate being late. And uh, I know years ago when I was in the Ohio legislature, I ran, I was in the General Assembly for 11 years and I, I chaired uh, two different committees. And I always said, I'm bringing the gavel down. I don't care what. If even I'm starting as a subcommittee of one, we're going to get started. So I'm sorry I'm late. But, uh, you know, I really appreciate it. And, again, I, was, I just want to thank uh, uh, Randy and the Free State uh, Foundation for inviting me to speak here today. And I also want to welcome uh, all of the distinguished guests and leaders. And thank you for all that you do to promote innovation and investment in the information and communications industry. And I'm particularly pleased to be speaking here today, and I want to acknowledge Randy and the Foundation's work in the area of FCC reform, and thank you for your effective advocacy on free market reform in the communications pol and policies. You know, within the last three decades, we have entered a digital age of communications and witnessed the emergence of multimodal competition in a dynamic internet ecosystem. This is quickly replacing the public switch telephone network and the TDM switching technologies with IP-based platforms. You know, in 2011, 34% of American households cut the cord, choosing to forego landline telephone services and rely only on wireless service. And then by the end of last year, that number of residential copper landline subscriptions will have declined by 70% by 2000. Additionally, mobile and broadband investment has exploded, creating more than one million jobs over the last five years. And that's something we want to keep bringing up over and over and over, is how many jobs are being created in this sector. That uh, when you look at those over those last five years and enabling a more rapid rollout of 4G LTE wireless technology across the United States. This advanced technology has not only spurred innovation in the communication marketplace, but it's also promoted growth and innovation in many other industries as well, including healthcare, transportation, and energy. In order to continue to build on this technological process and innovation, it is important to review laws and regulations to make sure they reflect today's marketplace and don't impede further advancements in communication and other sectors of the economy. And uh, I tell you, I think that we're very, very blessed that we've got Fred Upton sharing full committee. And we also have Greg Walden as the uh, telecommunications uh, sub-chair, because I think they both, they, they truly do both have the same mindset that you don't want to put those laws on the books or have those regulations out there by the regulators. They're going to impede growth in, these, in this so important a sector. It's clear that we need to comprehensively review the outmoded 96 Act and develop a new policy framework to address modern communications of the 21st century and a rapidly evolving internet economy to ensure that outdated and unnecessary legacy era regulations don't strife, stifle current and future investment, innovation, economic growth, 
and consumer choice in the digital age. And, you know, when you talk about those uh, regulations that are out there on the books, do you know one of the ones that comes up in committee quite often that we're out there talking about that the FCC has got to generate a report to do what? Let's talk about how the telephone and telegraph industries are really in some kind of a competition out there. Now, they could be doing something a little bit better than that. I'd like to see that report sometime. I want to see like a one-pager or somebody's out there writing a book on what, this, what that competition is today. You know, when I came in today, I noticed the old uh, 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 tele, teletype machine that's out there. And I remember years ago, because many of you might know, my dad was in Congress for 30 years. And in the speaker's lobby, it was set up where they would have the three teletype machines and they'd bring in all the newspapers from around the country, and they'd be all out there. I think it worked a little bit better back then because members were talking to each other a lot more because you know, everybody stood there as things were coming off the tele teletype machines. But we're not there anymore. You know, you look around today, and you've got members, well, you shouldn't be doing it on the floor, but, you know, you've got their handheld devices out there, and that's how, you know, you're getting information. When I was sitting in committee this morning, you know, it's all, I thought, it was just kind of interesting. So I put in breaking news, and by George, there we all were sitting in committee. So, you know, I, could, I thought, well, should I read about what we're doing or not? No, I better listen to what you're saying here today. So, you know, <laughs> but, you know, you do. You can sit there and actually, and that's how fast this is moving. It's a lot different. And so that's why, again, you don't want to stifle that investment. You don't want to stifle that innovation. Things are changing, and we've got to keep up with that. And that's one of the things is that we've said is that in many cases out in the industry, you might be two, three, four steps ahead of us before we can ever get a law written. Or, you know, and everything that you see today is, you know, they come out with a new product. You know, the last thing I ever do, I'm not sure if you're the same way, the last thing I ever do when I buy a new product, especially as dealing with something on the technological side, I do not look about a week later in the paper to see that it's just gone on sale because something new's come out. So, you know, that's the last thing you want to do. But that's how fast it is. And that, again, that's where I think that uh, Chairman Upton and Walden also see that direction, how things are going. While this may be a considerable undertaking, there are simple steps that we can take to make sure that these pro-investment, pro-competition, and most importantly, pro-consumer framework is a reality. One step is through the reform again at the FCC. A, re a review of the FCC operations and its role in the communications sector, again, it's long overdue. For especially when you're, we're still looking at the, to the competition between the telegraph and telephone uh, systems. I support Chairman Walden's effort to make sure that the reforms at the Commission to ensure that the agency isn't over-regulating the telecommunications industry and, again, interfering in that communications marketplace and remains accountable to the American people. To that end, we should statutorily reform the FCC to codify best practices, practices make the agency more transparent, and enable deregulatory procedures to improve regulatory certainty and stimulate increased investment and economic growth in the telecommunications industry. Overregulation, again, it's stifling our business ability to innovate and create uh, jobs here in the United States, and the cost of regulation to our economy is too great to ignore. So, you know, one of the things that we've been saying over and over and over is that, you know, when we, anything that we go out and talk about, we should be talking about creating jobs and growth in this country. And again, as I said a little bit earlier, this industry has a tremendous growth factor in it, and it also is creating those jobs out there for more and more people. The telecommunications industry drives, drives a significant portion of economic growth in our country. Nearly $250 billion in private capital has been invested in U.S. wired, wired and wireless broadband networks since 2009. There have been more private investment in the, in the information and communications technology sector than in any other sector of the U.S. economy. That's incredible. As members of Congress, we should make sure that the FCC does not produce regulations that will obstruct this kind of investment. Earlier this year, as was mentioned, I introduced the FCC's ABCs Act. This legislation required the FCC to conduct a cost-benefit analysis in any notice of proposed rulemaking, amendment to a rule, or final rule that may have an economically impact, significant impact. It's imperative that the FCC demonstrate that the benefits of any regulatory action outweigh the costs. A thorough understanding of a cost-benefit analysis during the rulemaking process will better inform those involved and prevent the costly burdensome decisions by the FCC. And uh, for one that truly believes that we actually have way too many regulations out there, you might have seen the Small Business Administration earlier 
this year had to revise what they'd put out. We have about $1.7 trillion of regulations in this country. $1.7 trillion worth of regulations that are being imposed on businesses and individuals and farmers. Go down the entire list. And it was updated to now it's about $1.8 trillion. In addition to requiring those cost-benefit analysis, this legislation would also modify the Commission's forbearance authority. It would add an evidentiary presumption to the Commission's forbearance authority as well as to the Commission's biennial review of regulations. This would empower the FCC to reach the regulatory decisions in regards to communications carriers as Congress originally intended. Technological developments and innovation have promoted robust competition and created a marketplace that is more efficient and better able to protect consumers than government regulation. These advancements have rendered many regulations to be outmoded and excessively burdensome on an industry that is absolutely essential to job creation in our nation's economic growth. We should do what we can to prevent these onerous regulations from obstructing future technological advancements, progress, and innovation. When Congress passed the Communications Act in 1996, attempting to create a retail market for set-top boxes, it did not mandate an integration ban. This was a brainchild of the FCC in 1998. It was an overreaching, unnecessary step to satisfying Congress's charge to support retail availability. The integration ban has forced consumers to pay higher prices for leased boxes. According to figures cited by the FCC, the, FCC, the integration ban imposes over $50 additional costs on each leased box, resulting in over $1 billion in increased costs without any additional benefit. It also is based on EPA figures, imposed additional energy consumption costs amounting to hundreds of millions of kilowatt hours per year. In another hearing, not relating to this bill, but when we were, I also serve on Energy and Power, when the, the new Secretary of uh, Energy was before, he actually brought this issue up. The FCC's decision intruded on business models and development plans by imposing techni technical standards that are better left to be determined by the market. This has significantly limited innovation by cable companies seeking to improve their boxes. Over the past decade, consumers have not warmed to the implementation of the cable card as consumers have only purchased 650,000 cable cards for use in alternative device. In contrast, cable has leased over 42 million set-top boxes with the cable cards in them as a result of the integration ban. In fact, the integration ban, rather than creating a market for retail available set-top boxes for cable cards, has created a market outside of the cable card regime. Over-the-top providers such as Roku, Apple TV, Google, and Xbox give consumers access to video services they demand without the use of cable cards. The market is changing faster than Congress can keep up, as I've mentioned. A recent example of how far the video market has come in recent announcement that Netflix has over 30 million domestic customers, effectively making it the fifth most watched network in the United States. This achievement was accomplished without a cable card and is a telltale sign of where the market is heading in an increasingly IP-based ecosystem. I recently introduced a bill to do away with this integration ban. And again, it's H.R. 3196, and it's a bipartisan bill. Congressman Gene Green from Texas is my lead co-sponsor. The bill would have no impact on cable oper operator obligations to support cable cards and retail devices. It also specifically preserves the FCC's authority to implement Section 629, but simply eliminates the unnecessary integration ban. Furthermore, cable companies will continue to support cable card devices because they must or risk the backlash of current subscribers joining the growing trend of cord cutters. The integration ban has outlived its usefulness and has cost consumers far more than has benefited them. It's time to remove the regulatory barriers and allow the marketplace to drive the next generation of innovation. Congress must surely get out of the way and stay out of the way. These issues and others that the Communications and Technology Subcommittees are addressing are critically important to the innovation that fuels our economy. Congress should be encouraging and enabling growth and ideas not holding back those taking risks and making substantial investments. 
And again, I've always had an open door policy. And if I don't hear from all of you out there, I, I can't do my job. And, uh, you know, when you said a little earlier that uh, when you're, you're going to say uh, commissioner, I was a commissioner, a county commissioner back in Ohio. A little bit different uh, responsibilities. But I started years ago having uh, th that as my main focus, that I have got to have my door open to everybody in this room and everybody out there because I can't make sound decisions. I can't write good pieces of legislation unless I hear from you. And, uh, that, you know, it's both ways, you know, the pros and the cons. But, again, I have got to hear it. And uh, when I'm home, uh, I... I think from the, the, the August work period of 12 to the end of this August work period, I did 400 individual meetings in my district. And uh, that's not political events for going to the county fairs or parades or anything. That's actually going through businesses and factories and farms, you name it. But that's why I make those decisions. You know, I have kids sometimes in schools always ask me, how do you come up with ideas for legislation? And I tell you what, it's not that from me driving down the highway in my district saying, you know what, this would be a great idea. I'm going to go back to Washington and get that bill drafted. It's usually it always comes from people I'm out there talking with and issues that they have. So I do really need to hear from you all. And again, once again, I want to thank you all for having me here. And uh, Randy, thanks very much. I greatly appreciate it. And again, I'm very sorry that I was late. Uh, the, the, sometimes the committee hearings last a little bit longer than anticipated, but today we pretty much figured that this one was going to run a minimum of four hours. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Latta. Uh, the Congressman has time for a couple of questions, so uh, why don't you raise your hand and uh, we'll bring the mic. And I'm going to call first on uh, Howard Buskirk from Communications Daily for the first question. Howard. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask. Historically, it's very difficult to uh, prove to get um, communications legislation through Congress, and you've got. Uh, I know a couple of things in the hopper right now. What's the outlook? Do you think that there's going to be any kind of legislative action on, on anything touching on communications regulation for the rest of this Congress? Well, you know, we have uh, a little bill we've got to get done before the end of next year on uh, Stella. And, of course, uh, you know, we're all really watching what's going on uh, uh, with, the, with the spectrum uh, with that auction. But uh, I think that as we, we work forward, that they, I've, I've been uh, working with uh, Chairman Walden and also uh, the full committee. And, I, you know, we're, I, I'm not one of these people that just likes to introduce legislation just to introduce legislation. We want to make sure these things get passed because I think it's important. So, you know, I, you know I, it's like everything else in life. You sure don't want to bet, bet the farm on it. But you know, one of the things that I, I truly believe is that, uh, you know, working with, the, with Chairman Walden and the subcommittee, that I think that we have a very good opportunity to get these passed. We have, have another uh, question. Any, anyone else? Yes, sir. I'll ask the question. Just, um, just, just a minute, Richard. We're re recording this for posterity. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, Richard Bennett with High Tech Forum. Um, as long as you're standing next to Randy, it seems opportune to, to talk about the New Communications Act without getting into Randy's recipe for it. Uh, I mean, at some point, it's obviously going to be necessary to update the 96 Act. And maybe that's only a one-page bill that d just repeals most of it. Uh, or maybe it's something more comprehensive. But it's probably uh, a five- or ten-year process to get that done. So at what point should Congress start thinking about what the next Communications Act is going to look like? Well, I tell you what, he does a very good job when he's testifying before us to bring that up. And, uh, <laughs> and why don't you want him to get into my recipe? I'm very interested. Okay. But, uh, you know, he does a very good job of, uh, about bringing it up. I and mean, we've had others that have testified on it. And again, it's we can't have things on the books that are holding, holding people back and holding companies back and holding that innovation back. And, and again, like I said earlier, everybody out there, it's moving so quickly that it's, you know, for us sometimes to try to say we're going to write this law, that all of a sudden we've written a law that's, you know, it's, it's, it's four stages back already or, or four regulations, you know, the same thing with they do try on a regulatory side. And, you know, we don't want to see things coming out of the FCC that are being promulgated that they then go over and they say, okay, this is what we're going to have, but all of a sudden, you know, 
if you go back several years, uh, where was the cloud at? You know, in, in people's thinking at that time. And when you hear people in committee uh, bringing up things that have happened in the past, you know, and I'm not going to date myself here, but I'll never forget uh, when I was practicing law years ago, and uh, uh, I was one of the I was working in a firm, and one of the firm uh, senior partners had gotten a car phone. This thing looked like someone's glove box. You know, remember, they had to drill it into the middle of the floor, and I mean, it was sitting there, and this huge phone that uh, you had. Who would have ever believed that today, you know, first of all, I can't believe, you know, my, you know, all, if all, your kids all have cell phones. You know, everybody's got a cell phone. That's how you can, well, actually, this is what happens with my kids. If I want to talk to them, I have to text them first. And by George, if I call them, they won't answer me. But if I text them, they said, call me, and all of a sudden they call me. It's, it's, a, it's a miracle. So, <laughs> so that, that's, that's what we're facing out there. And that's why I think that when you're looking at, What's, when you're looking at a law that's soon to be almost 20 years old, that'll be next year, be 18, that, you know, there's been a tremendous change out there. And so that's why I think that, you know, we've got to be looking at these constantly. And again, with uh, Greg Walden looking at the FCC reform, you know, I think that's important. You know, those are the steps we have to go through because, again, this is all changing before us so rapidly that if we don't do it, we're just going to have somebody else in some, some other country coming up with this stuff and not having it happen here. So. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Congressman Lana, thank you again. We always uh, try and give our speakers a little souvenir of the Free State Foundation. I have no idea what the latest ethics rules are over at the, <laughs> the House. I don't. It's, it, I, it's, it's tough. <laughs> I do know this, this cost about $8 and not uh, much more than that. So if you can take it, I'd like to give it to you. Okay. And, well, thank you very mod. much. Uh, thank you. But thanks very much. Join thank me in thanking her. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. You all have a great day. Okay, well, we're going to uh, pick right up uh, now with uh, Professor Professor Spados next. And I, I think it's just a segue and, and pick up on what I've, uh, you know, something that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the, you know, at the he House hearing yesterday, there was a lot of discussion, uh, and this goes to Bob's point, I think, about, uh, and, and there were some assertions that the current Communications Act is technology neutral. Uh, don't change it because it's technology neutral, or, or be careful how you change it. And that, we heard that over and over again. And, you know, and, and I pushed back against that, frankly, my, myself a few times and said, I don't think it is. It's, you know, we all often talk about the stovepipe regime and, and you know, that's uh, different regulatory uh, act, uh, different regulation tied to different uh, technical characteristics or function. But but one place you know where it doesn't seem obviously it's not technological neutral and it and it relates to VoIP. You know VoIP came up, up a lot yesterday. Is is the FCC? You know if it classifies it one way, Bob, then it's an information service. In another way, it's a telecommunications service, and that has different regulatory consequences. I think, uh, and you know, back in 2004, I wrote a piece uh, in 2004, God, it's almost a decade ago. It was called "The Metaphysics of VoIP," and it was just all about how the current Communications Act, uh, you know, didn't uh, really make sense as you had this technological revolution, uh, because to a consumer, he doesn't necessarily care whether it, it doesn't really care whether it's information service or telecommunication service. So with that, I'm going to turn to <clears throat> Professor uh, Spada, to Jim, and I, I, you know, I just want to uh, add this, that, that back, uh, I think it was 2005, he and I worked together along with a whole bunch of other uh, academics uh, and think tankers on a project to draft this model, Digital Age Communications Act. And uh, Jim was a co-leader with me on the part of it that was looking at a new regulatory framework. So that that might be useful to know as, as, as he speaks. And don't forget the Twitter handle, a new FCC. Jim. Um, thanks, Randy. Uh, it, it's interesting, um, before the congressman was here, we were talking about the theme of optimism and pessimism. And in fact, my first sentence here. Um, restated your question about an old FCC 
or uh, new FCC as a question of whether we should be optimistic or pessimistic. Um, and I do also want to take up Randy's suggestion uh, that he sent to me earlier that I might say a little bit about the DACA project and whether that has something to say for where we should go next. Um, and talking about the DACA project, of course, always creates plenty of opportunity for both pessimism and optimism. Um, on the pessimistic front, as I looked back over the years um, about the DACA project and the fact that I thought we did great work, but it didn't um, uh, penetrate at least into the U.S. code, um, the pessimistic take that I had for a while um, was based on, you know, academic wonderment. We wrote this great thing, why didn't it happen? Um, and the answer isn't that the case for a rewrite was poor. Um, the Communications Act still has, as Randy has been fond of calling them, regulatory silos. Um, uh, and those regulatory silos just don't map well onto converged internet communications. Um, so I don't think it was the academic case, um, but as I've come to think more about it over the years, I think the answer is somewhat different. And, and here is the optimistic take on why um, it didn't make its way into the U.S. code. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that the principal reason there wasn't a rewrite at the time um, was that the FCC had, prior even to the mid-2000s, administratively lifted much of the pressure that should have and would have created the impetus for the reform that we proposed. That is, the rollback of unbundling requirements, the rollback of tariffing, rate regulation, and the like, eliminated much of the burden of the traditional common carrier service uh, uh, system, and the innovation of classifying internet services as information services exempt them not only from Title II, but then began to exempt the converged services built on top of the internet services from much of the consequences of silos. Can anyone doubt that had the developing broadband uh, internet been subject to full-blown Title II regulation in the mid-2000s, that we would have had more pressure for <laughs> legislative uh, reform. Now, what do we take from that for today, or what do I take from that today? Um, in general, some cause for optimism. Um, as already said, wireless markets are, are fairly vigorous. The general internet ecosystem is quite vigorous. There continue to be many interesting stories of the development of adjacent market competition, which I think has been one of the great success stories um, of the internet. Um, but I'll temper that by saying if, if not either optimism or pessimism per se, there is some cause for caution, um, for it's undeniable that there are certain market and business model developments that can pressure what have been the fundamental norms of internet openness on which this vibrant ecosystem depends. Now, as to DACA, DACA specifically, I still think that this framework has a ton to recommend it in, in two senses. And the first sense is uh, what I've just adverted to is the fundamental assumption that DACA starts with is that networks, at least networks in what we call the internet ecosystem, um, should be interconnected, but recognizing simultaneously um, that that interconnection is largely provided by the market. And then second, um, in the sense that DACA demands a fairly clear theory of anti-competitive consumer impacts as a predicate to much administrative action. I think that predicate is substantive and it's an important um, predicate, subs uh, it's important to say that it's a substantive predicate because frankly as a matter of administrative law, and here I might be saying something more controversial, I don't think that the framework that the FCC um, works under is fundamentally broken, nor should it be burdened with additional requirements of formal hearings or steps in the analysis and the like. And why is that important? Because if if we're talking about the administrative context of the way in which the FCC operates, what DACA largely suggests, at least superficially, is that it's borrowing the FTC's law. It's borrowing a, a competition framework. And so the superficial question might be, well, why not just let the FTC take over? And that's a question which is um, in the ether out here and has even penetrated us in Chicago. Um, and I would say that the FCC under DACA or some other framework, in my view, continues to be quite necessary by virtue of its ability to make predictive judgments and to offer persistent forward-looking regulatory solutions in those cases in which they are necessary. Um, uh, to make this a little more concrete and, of course, a little more contemporaneous, um, I would take as an example the open internet order and what might have been different or what in fact might have to be different um, if, if if we're required to look at again at again were the framework that I have in mind uh, uh, to apply. 
Now, at one level, of course, the open Internet order does seem to be operating in large part against the backdrop of competition theory. But the discussion of that competition theory is not, in my view, closely enough tied to fi findings about the market structure and the regulatory requirements are not explicitly tied to market characteristics in the sense that they're not tied either to a, dominant, a carrier's dominant position or the carriers being vertically integrated into content or services. Nor has the FCC taken up any of the subsequent questions that are strongly suggested from the competition theory that it puts forward in that order, steps that might include, might is an important academic word, for example, um, a more directed proceeding on data caps and tiers and, and things like that. Um, I'll wrap up here, um, but let me conclude by uh, answering my own question, which is to say I'm largely optimistic based on my reconstruction, um, and by saying that although I may have suggested too much by saying administ administrative law is fine, I view the FCC's ability to make predictive judgments not as a license for loose theorizing, um, but as an opportunity for rigorously constructing a more uh, concrete notion of competitive markets and regulation that's clearly tied to those market consequences. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, you guys can see why I enjoy working so much with um, Jim back during that project. Uh, I don't know, I always called it DACA, and he calls it DACA, but we, we were working on the same the same uh, project. And, and uh, Jim, I'm an optimist, really a flat-out optimist, because yesterday at that hearing, uh, as the congressman alluded to, I had an opportunity to actually uh, promote DACA, and I, I think it's only been about 10 years, and then congressional time. <laughs> that might not be too long, but it, it will be. There will be uh, comprehensive communications reform in our lifetimes, I'm sure. Uh, so now we're going to turn to uh, Bill Kovacic. He might not really know all the details of, 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 of DACA, but one thing I'm sure he d does know uh, a lot about, an awful lot about, is the nature of the institutions, uh, the FTC and the FCC and how institutions run and might be made to run better and so forth. He may even know, he may even say for all I know that he thinks the FTC should take over all of the FCC's jurisdiction. I don't know, but Bill, it's up to you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Dhaka, of course, is a fascinating city in Bangladesh. Uh, in the <laughs> uh, um, my, my, my comments uh, <laughs> focus on two of America's most uh, extraordinary regulatory archipelagos and the issue, as Randy suggests, of who should do what. Uh, the first deals with what I think is the most contentious and significant uh, matter of economic regulatory policy uh, in the international sphere and in some areas of domestic policy making, and that's data protection and privacy. Uh, if we look today at who does what in that field, uh, it is easier to list the institutions that do not have a policy mandate than to list those who do. Uh, both at the national level, uh, the collection, the mosaic of federal oversight. At the state level, the extraordinary role that state governments play. At the county and municipal level, right down to local police stations, the astonishing array of public institutions that have a hand in shaping policy is something to behold. Uh, partly by accident, partly by design, uh, in the past 20 years, the Federal Trade Commission has evolved as the principal U.S. data protection authority. And in discussions about the future of data protection, it is often assumed that the FTC will continue to evolve in its role, using its own mandate, to be the national data protection regulator under a more coherent and uniform federal scheme. There are many obstacles to doing that. It is impossible to imagine the FTC planning, playing that role, and impossible to imagine the U.S. having a coherent national data protection policy if a stunningly important part of the information services sector is not subject to its oversight, how will the United States achieve a broad set of coherent, consistent data protection rules if the common carrier exception remains in place? I'm not going to press the point to ask you to accept its abandonment across the board. But I just want to suggest to you that so long as that part of the information services economy 
And mind you, those service providers uh, have some role to play in data security and privacy policy. Uh, the United States will not achieve anything faintly approaching the more coherent, consistent, uh, and rational platform for policymaking that is seen as indispensable if it's to have sensible policies at home, as well as a coherent voice abroad. Uh, we were talking about the 18th anniversary of the 96 Act. Uh, next year is the 100th anniversary of the Federal Trade Commission Act. That could be a good occasion, not insisting on annual reviews, but how about once every 100 years? <laughs> we go back to ask whether the quaint assumptions, now quaint in light of past experience about who should do what, might be subject to change. Uh, topic two, the second archipelago with many islands is merger review. If there's a telecommunications merger, who gets to play? Well, it's the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, not the FTC because of that other limitation I mentioned. The Federal Communications Commission, as you know, conducts an independent review of competition issues plus public interest considerations. We go to our state governments and each of our state attorneys generals have competence under the law to apply the national anti-merger control mechanism. And the state public utility commissions, as uh, Bob just mentioned a moment ago, get to play with respect to activities affecting uh, their own jurisdictional borders. And if all of the national and state authorities stand aside, there's still the possibility of private suits, even though those aren't easy to bring. You can stand back and make the case that some number of enforcement authorities greater than one has benefit. That number, though, is widely regarded as an optimal choice to be short of infinity. And in the spectrum of policymaking activity, we are a lot closer to infinity than we are to one. And when you look uh, at the role that other jurisdictions are playing to get the regulatory framework right, who stands alone in its indifference to the regulatory architecture. We spend so much time talking about the feasibility of making bullet trains with no discussion in the regulatory arena about the adequacy of the infrastructure. Uh, the United States could buy trains that go 250 miles an hour, but they still have to go through those tunnels between New York and Washington and slow down to 40. They won't work. We talk about larger policy reforms. We don't talk about the regulatory infrastructure over which policy must travel. Let me give you one suggestion if we don't want to address that head on. How about a policy of transparency which the FCC could adopt, which clearly identifies measures that are adopted only pursuant to the public interest mandate, that denominates clearly the matters that are relevant to competition policy, but where the Venn diagrams of analysis don't overlap to spell out precisely the remedial measures that are adopted pursuant to the public interest mandate and explain how they advance the public interest, not to shroud them with the larger set of considerations associated with the competition policy mandate. What about giving the entire mandate to the Department of Justice? We don't go back to that common carrier exception. Why not give the entire competition mandate to the department and leave the FCC to do the additional public interest, interest review, perhaps in association with the Department of Justice? Uh, my interest in the UK assignment that Randy mentioned is that so many other jurisdictions are taking very seriously the question of how to establish a policy-making infrastructure that promotes coherent national results in the expectation that if you achieve a better policy-making infrastructure, you will increase the possibilities for delivering good economic results for your citizens. The United States complacently is missing a good game. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. That was That's a, a lot there uh, to think about. Uh, so here's what we're going to do uh, now. Uh, I'm going to ask... Uh, while I'm speaking, uh, the panel to think about uh, questions that they might want to ask their other panelists. I'm giving them an opportunity to do that. Uh, and then uh, I may ask a question or two. And I'm, then I'm going to uh, see whether there are questions from the uh, audience uh, as well. Uh, and then we're also going to, and I apologize for not doing this before, I, I'm uh, going to ask my uh, distinguished uh, Free State Foundation colleague uh, Deborah Taylor Tate to come up and having served on the FCC and 
Uh, I'm sure she has a lot of thoughts as she uh, listens to, to this discussion back and forth. Uh, maybe uh, if you would give us uh, three or four minutes of just reactions uh, at some point as well. Uh, I can do that with uh, Debbie because I've given her so many cups and T-shirts and everything. I don't have to give her anything to, to ask her to come up and do this. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, do any of the uh, panelists, do you want to react to uh, anything that was said by your fellow co-panelists? Or would you prefer that I just be the provocateur? Okay. Uh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to give you this if you if, if there's. <laughs> uh, so anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I, that's I prefer that. Actually, very provocative and started me thinking. Um, you know, obviously, we have uh, a regulatory architecture here in the United States that, you know, whether it was built by uh, considered thought or by historical accident. Um, it is what, what it is. Um, but uh, obviously the, the, the difference in the way the rest of the world looks at this is obviously important to us as well because many of the companies that we represent are in fact international companies and uh, particularly as, as competition, competition gets out of, you know, purely kind of horizontal competition but occurs at very different levels, um, that, that regulatory architecture matters. So I wondered if um, you had a, a, a plan or an idea as far as, uh, in, in addition to maybe the, the transparency ideas that you set out about how we promote maybe greater consistency while we're in a different regulatory architecture and, and maybe um, what you're hearing from our European counterparts as far as uh, either what they what they can't understand or, or what they hope to achieve through their own uh, revisions. Yes, Bill. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, if we were thinking about companies, the typical choice uh, in pursuing an, an integration uh, uh, through Ronald Coase, through Ollie Williamson, is do you integrate by ownership? That is by combining functions within a simple, single institution, or do you integrate by contract? Uh, and I'm aware of the difficulties associated with the legislative efforts to accomplish integration by ownership. That is to move things across boundaries, extraordinarily difficult. Legislative committees don't do that unless you give them something in return. You, you either need a tremendous uh, a regulatory smash-up that creates the urgency to reform, or you cannot take from one committee one responsibility without giving them something back in trade. So let's assume for a moment that we are frozen in place with the distribution of authority. The other alternative is by contract, which means deeper integration across agencies uh, through voluntary cooperation. Um, uh, in the field of competition law, um, we do not have anything uh, equivalent to a domestic competition network. If you take the nexus of all public authorities, state and federal, regulatory bodies with competition law competence, such as the FCC, FERC, uh, and you ask, on what occasion during the year does everyone with an overlapping mandate in the public sphere sit down to begin the conversation about what we're doing, much less the question of what consistent principles should be, that doesn't happen. There are synapses that link individual institutions. There are cooperative processes. But one thing we see, and I think can be borrowed from other experiences, another number of jurisdictions that recognize this allocation of authority say, we need deeper integration through cooperation, uh, through a network that promotes the development of consistent standards, identifies anomalies, addresses them, and not a begrudging as necessary cooperation, but a willing recognition of complementarities. Uh, that similar approach could apply to privacy. There is no comparable privacy network. And if I were to take the high ground that, address, that needs uh, attention, I think most urgently, it is data protection and privacy. That is, you can't possibly go ahead, uh, especially if you look outside the country. One of the great puzzlements to outsiders is who on earth does what in your country? 
and that is who's responsible for what? Is it the healthcare people over here? It's the food and drug people there. If it's a telecommunications company, it's somebody else. It's the FC, FTC. Here's the state of California doing something still over here. Who's minding the store? Uh, and a way to address that, to approach that, is at least through voluntary integration of decision making and discussion to create networks, frameworks, not grandiose structures by which those policymakers spend more time talking to each other. And more important, the case handlers and managers spend more time talking about what standards should be. That's my fallback. No legislative change to the basic framework approach. Um, uh, that wouldn't be a bad place to start. Okay. Uh, I think I do uh, want to uh, exercise the right to be provocative here. So I'm going to ask uh, first uh, Jim uh, to, since he's the law professor here, uh, one, one of the one of the two, uh, but probably the one closest to this area. Uh, me too. So we're all, all, we're probably all, we know that. But I'm going to ask Jim uh, to predict the outcome of the uh, net neutrality appeal in the D.C. Uh, circuit uh, and uh, tell us what he thinks about that. Then I'm going to ask uh, James and Bob uh, to tell us what they want to see uh, the outcome uh, to be in that case and explain why, uh, why they prefer that outcome. Uh, James. Jim. Jim. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> You've got all those titles that I read out uh, earlier. Over. Okay. I mean, you. everyone knows where I stand on the issue of what ought to be the outcome. Well, tell um, them if everyone does. I've that. written several times that the FCC just doesn't have this kind of authority. Now, I've also written several times that they ought to have this kind of authority, but that's probably something Randy doesn't want me to mention. But... Um, uh, I, that's what I think is the right answer. I, I just don't think the theories of ancillary jurisdiction or 706 or any of the other little numbers that get thrown around do it. That's not what I predict will happen. I predict what will happen is, um, I'll put my bartender hat on here, a continued muddle um, and that it'll result in a remand that essentially says something like, that 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 continues to lack a clear authority of a uh, clear theory of what the court thinks the FCC's authority is, but it'll decide what it did here was a step too far, maybe even a little more muddied than that, a step too far because not explained adequately. Although, for my seminar, I had the opportunity to reread the order last week, and there's a lot of explanation there. So. Um, that's what I think will happen. It'll, it'll be a muddle. There won't be a clear D.C. Circuit authority about what the boundary is, and, but they'll say this was a little too much, either on a substantive ground or on an explanation ground, and it'll go back again. That's my guess. Don't, uh, bet on, don't, don't place your own money on it. Can you envision the, uh, if that happens, uh, do you think that the FCC uh, would attempt to impose Title II uh, Re regulation in the aftermath of, of the decision? I doubt it, but I live in Chicago. So, um, That's the outside the Beltway defense. No, I mean, I, I, in, in, the, in preparing for the seminar, I reminded myself that um, after the third way proposal, there was a letter from Congress, I think, signed by more than 110 um, uh, current senators and representatives at the time. I don't know what the number would be today, but I don't think it would be materially smaller um uh and the the letter opposed uh yeah it opposed the, the reclassification of yeah. title two regulation yeah. okay well that was just to give uh bob and james more time to think about their answer <laughs> uh so uh james uh what would you say so my question is what how is it what, do, what, or what do i want to what, happen what do yeah. you speaking uh yeah you know, for the entire cable industry or sure. <laughs> want, want to happen this here. This is water. <laughs> uh, sure. I, I mean, I'll echo first in saying I don't, have no idea how it's going to come out. Um, you know, there's an interesting irony here when I look at this case. I think it's incredibly, incredibly important for communications law students and incredibly irrelevant for consumers. Um, and that is because the cable industry, and I'm sure Bob would say the same, uh, 
is building an open internet, believes in an open internet, and the day after the case comes out, we are still going to have an open internet. So they're incredibly uh, complicated and, and very interesting from a kind of law professor or law student point of view, questions about ancillary jurisdiction and the authority of the commission. Uh, but I think what's most important is that we not lose sight of the tremendous benefit that we've seen from an open internet, the tremendous incentives that I think network operators have to build internets that consumers want to use to provide services that consumers demand. Uh, and I don't think anything that will happen in the DC circuit or thereafter is, is going to change any of that. So my hope uh, for uh, the future uh, after the decision is handed down is that the FCC, whatever it chooses to do, uh, or whatever it is able to do, uh, returns to first principles, returns to that regulatory humility that I spoke of, uh, and that has benefited consumers immeasurably by launching this tremendous cycle of innovation and investment that continues to inure to their benefits in building faster networks um, as far as the eye can see. Okay. Uh, before B Bob answers, just to, so I understand your answer and maybe even draw it out further, I, I, I assume that uh, at least in part you're saying if, if the uh, – decision were affirmed uh, uh, that because it, 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 it you know uh, has a non-discrimination provision and no blocking provision but yeah but part of your uh, uh, optimism about our lack of concern is is based on a, a view that or at least a hope the FCC is going to continue to exercise this regulatory that, humility that, that, that you talked about because if they got regulatory sure. unhumble, then that might be another. No, and that that's fair. And, you know, in, in truth, Randy, the cable industry did not, is, is not part of the lawsuit. And we were not so because we believe there was at least a colorable path for the FCC to continue to exercise that regulatory authority, even in the face of the open internet order. But that's not to be say that there is also great danger if they turn and take a different view. Bob, um, I I agree with with James. I mean, I I think this is so much ado about nothing. It'll make it'll make uh, great law review articles. I'm sure about what the extent of the FCC's authority is. I don't think it's going to matter a hoot to consumers. Um, I, I think you know we we supported the FCC action, and we supported the FCC action so that we could stop talking about net neutrality and Title II because it was actually putting kind of this, this overhang on the investment community and everything that we did had this huge overhang to it. And when we signed up for it, we signed up for it because we didn't have to change a single business practice in order to, in order to live within what the FCC was talking about. And, and you know, I, you know, so uh, my 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 great fear is at the end of this, we're going to have a huge disruption again, and then we're going to have this whole conversation about Title II and and everything else, and it's going to suck all of the air out of the room. When the reality is that James can be optimistic because we've had all these orders where we haven't imported Title II into into the IP world, but I live in a world where I can't turn off pots until the FCC actually says it's okay to turn off pots. I can't stop investing in the TDM world until then. And if we spend the next two years or three years talking about net neutrality again, we're never going to get to those issues. And that's, you know, so I live in a world where I don't think it's going to matter who to consumers. I think the internet's going to be open the day before the order comes out. It's going to be open the day after the order comes out. And it's going to be open a year later as well. And, and nothing is going to change. But in this town, all of the action is going to get sucked out of the room because we're going to spend 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, 366 in leap years, talking about net neutrality for the next three years if, if, if this all gets disrupted. OK, 
Okay. Uh, Jim Spada has his hand up, so we're going to at least talk about it for another minute here. Uh, Jim. I wrote a speech for a conference many years ago that said, can we stop talking about net neutrality? And um, uh, between when I wrote it and had to deliver it was the Comcast reporting about the Comcast um, case. So uh, I agree with all that's been said, except let me say that I think the case matters a little bit more than for those of us who write telecom case books, um, it, and I include myself. Um, that is, the easiest path to a, to a clean win for the, for the FCC is for the, for the Court of Appeals to say what the Supreme Court said in the city of Arlington is in fact what they meant, um, administrative law professors' doubts notwithstanding, and that the FCC is entitled to maximum Chevron deference any time it decides what its ancillary jurisdiction is. So you and I are all cool with the inter open internet order, but that's not what the stakes are about for me in what the appeal is about. The second issue I want to say is, is yeah, I'm optimistic and I, the internet will remain open, et cetera, but I'm among those who looks at, look at some of the developments of integrated vertical business models in the internet and say to myself, there's some reason to think that our fundamental presumptions of openness that have continued to generate this ecosystem face some pressures. And so that's the second part of the stakes that I think this case involves. Did, did you want to well, say Well, I, I was only else? going to respond and say I, I, I think that's, that is absolutely a fair point. I think we also have to recognize that there are, are other governmental authorities that can deal with that in addition to the FCC. And your puts on takes on whether or not you feel that the other agencies are up to the task is obviously different people are going to have different views. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to ask a, a final question or, or uh, put this out there, and then I'm going to turn to the uh, audience. But because the nature of the program was to talk about reorienting the FCC and reforming the FCC, we haven't really talked uh, so much about sort of what I would call pure process matters, perhaps. And uh, so I'm going to really ask James and Bob, I know, I think Jim said earlier, uh, and I think it's fair enough from his viewpoint, he does, I, I, I think he said he doesn't see the need for sort of uh, process reforms along the lines of the bill that's been introduced, uh, draft bill by Chairman Walden. And that contains, as you know, a number of things that would require the FCC to do rulemakings differently. and, and uh, you know, conduct meetings differently. It, it would change the Sunshine Act and all that. So maybe just in a minute or two, if you uh, have reactions to uh, those types of process reforms, let's get those on the table uh, before we go to the audience. I, I, I mean, I we we are very, you know, supportive of, of uh, legislation to look at process reforms. I mean, obviously, um, you don't always need a law. Sometimes you can just change the processes. Um, you know, the integration ban bill that Congressman Latta is a is a great example uh, of uh, an area where historically we've we've had trouble. We've had to go. The cable industry has had to go seek waiver upon waiver upon waiver. We waited a year before we could get a waiver for these uh, very low cost. Uh, standard definition, uh, you know, the size of a, basically a pack of credit cards uh, that could perform a tuning function on your second or third set, waited a year before we could do that. And then when we decided we wanted to also provide that in HD in the same form factor without the cable card, we had to wait another 15 months after that. So, you know, those, the, and, and those decisions, you know, we can laugh about it, but they do have consequences in the sense that our industry was trying to get those out there uh, in an effort to go all digital, to be able to reclaim analog bandwidth and to improve the capabilities of our networks. And if we have to wait two plus years uh, to go through a waiver process that can kind of uh, drone on and on and on, um, you know, that's not good for consumers, that's not good for innovations, and, and that's a process that we ought to take a look at. Um. Bob, do you, have, do you have any comments on process reform? You know, Where? legislation in this area I think could be helpful, um, but I, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, um, the FCC has got an obligation under the existing law to get rid of um, obsolete regulations. They have to do a review of everything every two years. 
despite having done seven of those. We still had some telegraph rules on the books that then the FCC took 15 months before they could decide that they get rid of telegraph regulations. I don't know. My telegraph works great. <laughs> <laughs> just me, but you know, maybe maybe other people are having problems. I, so I, I just don't. I don't think that that legislation is necessary. The FCC actually, um, the way that the current act is structured, the FCC has the power under the act to waive its own rules. They have, at least as it relates to the Title II business, and, and this, this is an area that, that Title VI does not have this, um, they can um, forbear from Title II regulation. Um, and they have preemptive authority for the, for the telecom um, uh, rules to preempt states from doing things inconsistent. So in terms of the overall reform from a, from a telecom standpoint, I think legislation would be nice, it would be helpful, but it's not necessary because the tools are there for them to, to be able to engage in it. I, I think as we, as we get into the, the video reforms, our, our, our video service is IP, um, we do not consider it or classify it as a cable service, so I don't have a lot of the same, um, I don't have a lot of the same obligations as a cable service provider that James's and member companies have, and, and they would maybe benefit from having the equivalence of forbearance for some of those rules, um, and that's not in the act as it exists today, and we certainly don't have that for the MVPD stuff. Okay, well, he's probably going to pass back that cup to you on that last, <laughs> on that last note. Uh, okay, now, so what I'm going to do, oh, Bill, do you have a quick comment on this? I mean, one, one, one point of process reform that you mentioned that I think has great stakes for the entire administrative state is the Sunshine Act. Uh, if you were uh, seeking to develop a measure that would uh, go a great way to disable the effectiveness of collaborative decision-making, and you were inimical to the interests of the United States, and you wanted to encumber <laughs> the administrative process, I think you would draft something like the Sunshine Act. Uh, and you would say, I like this measure because it's going to get in the way of the collaborative process working effectively. And when you look at all of the assumptions that the administrative law literature uh, has made in promoting the development of uh, the administrative tribunal, that is to have a collectivity, uh, imagine federal courts being unable uh, to spontaneously discuss with less than a, with more than a quorum uh, matters of interest to them. Uh, imagine uh, that uh, you weren't able to have that kind of interaction on adjudicative tribunals on a spontaneous basis. Uh, again, a comparative perspective when you when you do a side by side comparison of the U.S. with other agencies, and you walk through them the inhibitions on spontaneous discussions. Walk into the lunchroom at the FTC to talk about a merger. Uh, if it's two of your colleagues, they're talking away about it as soon as you arrive. How about those Cardinals or Red Sox? Uh, the inability to talk about those matters. You look at experience overseas, there is not a single observer, scholar or regulator outside this country that does not look at this mechanism and say, you're out of your minds. Uh, okay. So I think there is an issue here, a larger question about the functioning and operation of the collective decision-making process as it was intended. That's worth discussing uh, as part of a larger deliberation about the administrative process. Now, uh, thanks for bringing that up. That's a good point. I, that's another uh, couple decade old project of mine uh, as well. Okay, we're going to turn to the question and answer uh, period here now. So I'll call, and, and, and look, uh, I want to get a, several questions in, so we're going to keep these questions and not uh, speeches and try and get a few in. Scott, you're first. So this is Scott Cleland for the record here. Scott Cleland, Net Competition. What one thing could prospective chairman um, uh, Tom Wheeler do when he arrives to signal he has a modern approach to the FCC? Okay, who wants to take that? I think that's, uh, that's a good question. Anyone want to know? Oh, I can't tell Tom resist. Wheeler. Well, I mean, the, from my perspective, the one thing one that he thing. could do is he could say, 
you know, by some date certain, we are going to retire all the legacy TDM architecture in this country. That's one thing he could do. Okay. Anyone else have any suggestions? Okay, any, next question. Anyone else? I'm going to uh, call on Howard again for another question. Sorry to ask another question, but this is a companion question to the to um, Scott's question, and I just wanted to ask: so, to what extent do you believe that um, Mr. Wheeler is going to be looking at trying to develop a new paradigm for trying to get regulation to kind of keep up with the IP and you know and the, and the new era? And how is that counterbalanced by the fact that he doesn't have a whole lot of time, and also you know the potential distraction? That could be the follow-up to the D.C. Circuit's net neutrality decision. Well, I mean, you know, I, I said before, I, I, I fear that if, if, if the D.C. Circuit overturns all or part of the order, um, we are going to get caught in a swirl really quickly about the application of Title II to Internet services. Now, to the extent that the administration makes a very fast decision to appeal that to the Supreme Court, I think we have a, he's got a, he creates himself, I think, a window of opportunity because as long as it's not appealed to the Supreme Court, he, he can have a clean runway at least. It'll be an overhang, but at least he would have a clean runway, um, I think, in which to operate where he doesn't have to get sucked into the swirl of Title II on Internet services. Um, he does have um, a short time frame, um, getting shorter all the time. And I, I think he's obviously got a lot of things that he's going to have to accomplish. He's going to have to get these auctions, the incentive auctions, up off the ground um, and, and start it. But I, I think there's still, you know, he still has the ability to be able to kind of take some of the core fundamental principles that were in the National Broadband Plan, which says, hey, we have to make this transition to start to push that rock down the hill so that it can gain momentum. The TDM infrastructure is not going to be retired by the time Tom Wheeler leaves the FCC, but he can make an enormous amount of prog progress by, by basically saying, hey, this was a core part of the National Broadband Plan. And, and we are going to implement that. We're going to begin the stage of implementing. Everyone knows this isn't a flash cut. Everyone knows this is going to take time. But we're going to begin that project, and we're not going to look back from it. And I think the tone at which he attacks that issue, I think, can still make an enormous amount of progress, even though everybody is going to understand he can't finish that project by the time he leaves. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to make a quick, quick response to Howard? Okay, if not, we'll ask another uh, question. Uh, I'm going to ask Jim. Uh, Jim. Thanks. Uh, my question is, uh, is for Bob, at least at first. Um, early on, you mentioned the example uh, for the proposition that the FCC really is uncomfortable about how to act in uh, the new environment, and you mentioned the text to 911 uh, situation. Um, my question is, how do you think you know, at least going forward, and maybe not text 911, but, you know, a future important public safety issue. Um, in such a situation, um, do you think they should try to reach everybody, including the over-the-top providers, uh, or, or refrain from reaching anybody, which would have, you know, public safety consequences perhaps, or do what I think they tried to do, which was to reach those that they have clear jurisdiction over so they can. What, what should they do in the future in a situation I, I, I like think that? we have to, I think we're going to have to, at some point in this country, we're going to have to tackle, and I think the FCC is the agency, you know, du jour that, that, that has the ability to do this. But we're going to have to tackle what are the characteristics of this, and I would say that the, the subset is real-time communications, right? That's really what we're talking about. When people talk about the ability to do 911, we're talking about some services that are real-time communications. We're not, we're not talking about your Starbucks app on the telephone. But when it comes to real-time communications, which you know was the core service that we regulated for 100 years, 
the Communications Act of 34 is from 1934, but that's the core service of, of the telephone infrastructure that's been in place in this country for 100 years. And we're going to have to start having a discussion about what the characteristics of services that are taking the place of that are going to have to be, because those are the ones that we're going to attach these public safety types of obligations to. Um, I, I think it's a hard discussion to have. Right now we're playing whack-a-mole, um, but, but you know the, the way that they were going to approach text 911 just didn't make any sense at all because we've hit the tipping point on text messaging services to over the top, and you're just going to see a rapid decline of that. And I, I think it tees up the question to say, if it's really important if you're using a text messaging service that it reached 911, We've got to figure out what that service looks like and how we're going to uh, impose that obligation if that's what we choose to do. And that's a discussion that I don't think they're comfortable with. And I, I think it's a really hard, hard discussion to have. But, but eventually, it's, you know, we, we know it applies to interconnected VoIP. But so what have we done? So Skype's not interconnected VoIP. I mean, you, you've kind of created with interconnected VoIP, you've created, you know, a regulatory free zone. If you don't both, if you don't have the capability, if your, your service doesn't have the capability both of making calls and receiving calls, the rules don't apply. What that does is it gives an incentive not to have a lot of interconnectedness. With, with text to 911, if Bob, you don't... But I mean, go ahead. And if you don't have the capability to reach everyone, um, you don't. It doesn't apply. But that that promotes not having interconnected services, and I I think it's a hard question. I, I agree. The, the, I mean, it, I agree entirely with what you said. I will say that while it's a hard conversation, we are in the position to echo one of Bill's themes to look around and find some of these definitions. The the EU framework has a definition of electronic communications networks in it. Is it perfect? No. But there have been a lot of other systems that have tried to attend to this question to add to bills who does what to add the third prong to whom. To whom. Right. right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, call on Seton. Now remember a question. Uh, it's a not, a speech, <laughs> not a speech. I'm going to address what James discussed, which is a cost-benefit analysis. There is a law in the books, the Paper Work Reduction Act. And I know for a fact that the, the, it's supposed to be done before they impose regulations. I know for a fact it was done after they imposed net neutrality. So my question is, is that insufficient? Is that just so completely ignored? Is there, is, would it be worthwhile to draw greater attention to that? As a, as a sort of at least stopgap until we get a better cost benefit law passed. I mean, is that it, it, for some reason that's sort of an afterthought? It's a twenty year old law, and no one seems to point to that as a possible, at least partial solution to the, the cost benefit of analysis of a regulation. Well, it, it, I'm certainly no expert on uh, the Paperwork Reduction Act, although I can't say it's probably a growth area. Um, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, certainly we, we all benefit from uh, pressure testing the effects of the laws, the regulations that are created, and I think a greater sensitivity um, to the, the impact uh, and, and the likely cost of some of uh, the rules, and, and not only of new rules. I think part of the problem we face is that a lot of times, you know, history has a great pull. You know, we're, we're all lawyers. We love precedent. Uh, but the markets change so quickly, the sands just shift underneath our feet constantly. And what may have seemed like an immutable axiom at one point in given time is just totally gone. So I think we have to constantly challenge ourselves not to look at the law as it was enacted at the time it was enacted, but also to constantly test the relevance, to constantly assess the costs uh, that are being uh, created by that regulation versus the benefits, if there are any, that it's providing. Okay. Were you just raising your hand to your chin, or were you got, did you want to say? I, here's what I worry about cost-benefit analysis, right? Um, is what work is it doing um, sub rosa on a substantive uh, level? Which is to say, 
under all administrative law. You don't have to spend any time at the D.C. Circuit to know that an administrative agency's decision can only be affirmed if the administrative agency offers a theory as to why it's better than not doing what they could have done instead, right? They've just got to have a theory. Now, to emphasize what Bill says, that theory could be, under our current statute, a public interest theory, right? It could be a non-economic theory, et cetera. And so when we talk about pushing on cost-benefit analysis, I am sure we are making a substantive judgment about A, what costs and benefits count, and B, what evidence do we want to, to require there to be before we permit action. But just to say agencies have to have think that the benefits exceed the costs, that's administrative law for <coughs> forever. I mean. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jim. And, and, you know, those were all good questions. And I wish we could just go on and on. And uh, I, could, <laughs> I could go on and on for a long time because uh, they, they're great questions and uh, the answers were equal to the uh, questions. But what I want to do now, as I said earlier, is uh, – ask uh, my colleague uh, Debbie Tate to come up and she's probably been thinking a bit throughout this whole conversation. Uh, I can tell these people a thing or two about what the FCC should be doing. So just like the others, I'm, I'm going to give her a strict five minutes and then we're going to wrap it up. But I'm, I'm sure this uh, will further educate all of us. Thanks, Randy. It's always nice to be back and especially to be here with the Free State Foundation. and. Um, my colleagues, it's great to see Bill especially because I haven't seen him in a while and to catch up on him. So I brought a couple of props with me thinking, not knowing what people would say, but just to remind us when the Telecom Act was written. So usually a picture is worth a thousand words. And so I, I think it is, you know, important just to think about how long that these laws have been around and what our country and our infrastructure looked like in terms of uh, the past. And of course, I love Congressman Lattice talking about the IP ecosystem and the transformation that's going on and um, how these legacy regulations really don't fit in an app world, uh, in the cyber world that we're in today. Um, one of you all brought up, and I thought it was interesting, James, maybe it was you, or, oh, Bob, it was you, because you all do have to deal with the state PUCs. So I thought I might just give you an example of what our governor in Tennessee did and that is that the TRA is now a part-time agency. And why should it be? Because they don't have nearly as much responsibility and legal authority as they did when the PUC was originally set up. And I had been very vocal about the fact that as the responsibilities and legal authority, our state legislature had removed much of the authority. So anytime that you all want to to uh, pay me to go around to the rest of the 49 states and talk about that, I'll be happy to. I was pretty successful in Tennessee. Um, so anyway, I also really appreciated the fact that everyone talked about kind of this rededication to a consumer-centric market approach. James, I think that was your phrase. And I really like it a lot because I think that's what we all forget in Washington a lot is we're, we're talking about either legal issues or uh, appellate court court rulings or uh, words like net neutrality that nobody in the public has any idea about, when really all that they're interested in is what is the new hot thing, right? So this just came out last week, obviously, even though Dick Tracy had one, you know, 50 or 60 years ago. Um, so I'm glad that uh, that we've caught up with Dick Tracy, at least. Um, and so why is it so important? I mean, why, why is it important that there is regulatory consistency? It, it's not solely about our economy, although, as we know, it's about a fifth of our economy, but it's also about education and entertainment and health care and jobs. So I thought that was really interesting that the congressman brought up the million jobs that are in this sector. So that's why this is so important. That's why, as the Free State Foundation says, ideas do matter. They really do matter for this country. Um, I'm very interested in some of Bill's work because we do have to continue to be not only the innovation leaders, not only the economic leaders in this world, but we have got to continue to be the policy leader. The, the, the FCC, when I first started on my very first trips to the ITU, was basically every time I got introduced, it was as the gold standard 
for the entire world in terms of regulation. I don't know if, if my colleagues are being introduced that way now or not. Um, also, so this is a yield light, right? So I guess my advice to the new FCC when they finally get in place is just to stop for a moment and do precisely what everyone here is saying and every lawyer in the room, and that is, what is your legal authority? Before you take one step toward an order or any kind of policy or regulatory action, what is the legal authority for what you're doing? Obviously, I feel like um, during my tenure that we did do a lot to help, that there was robust competition. Um, and so the, the FCC has created some policies. When you hear about the investment, the investment was made because there were good policies. Um, but at the same time, we have to think about is the rule or regulation or policy really um, necessary or does it stifle investment and competition? And then if it does, please stop. Stop before you do anything. I cannot believe that every time I come back to Washington, we're still talking about net neutrality. You know, all I go back to is in 2009, sitting there and hearing the BitTorrent Comcast discussion. You know, what was it, a um, barbershop quartet that got cut off or slowed down? Okay. So that's what we're talking about. But stop. Stop over-regulating. Stop stifling U.S. companies' ability to invest. Stop sending more costs to consumers by passing more unnecessary regula regula regulations. And then I loved the point about um, forbearance. Stop not using forbearance. And then finally, will you please do no harm for all of us. So anyway, I've enjoyed being here so much. Um, Bill, I'm in total agreement with you about let the sun shine in on the FCC. That could be a great step. And that is one issue that all the Republicans and Democrats agree on. So I don't know why we can't get that done. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Debbie, thank you very much, and uh, thank you uh, for everything that you uh, do for the Free State Foundation. We appreciate it. Bill, I don't know if you know this, but Debbie travels all over the world all all the time, so sometimes I, her time's limited and for some things. But if you ever need a recommendation over there and wherever you're going for some good restaurant or, or whatever or, or more than that, then I'm sure she she has one. Uh, and on the forbearance, I don't know if you remember this, but I bet you do. It was back in 1995. I remember when the administrative conference before it was defunded and then refunded. I, I actually <clears throat> chaired a committee that issued a report on reforming the uh, Sunshine Act back in in 1995. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that might get done one day as well. Uh, well, listen, this, uh, you know, like I said, I could I could go on and on, but you guys probably can't. This was really a terrific uh, panel. And uh, join me, please, in thanking this uh, fantastic panel. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. You can. Go ahead.